Uh, good afternoon. I am ESP Executive Vice President and I have the pleasure to welcome and thanks our panelists and all of you. Since uh, last March, we have all been discussing how the COVID pandemic is reshaping geopolitics, accelerating some ongoing trends, reverting or posing others. The Western Balkans, uh, one of the most heavily hit region in the world, have not been spared from this uh, readjustment. First, the pandemic has offered China the opportunity to increase its influence over the region, first through its mask diplomacy, more recently through its basin diplomacy. By all accounts, Serbia was the first European country to receive the Sinopharm vaccine, the first to start domestic production of the vaccine, and the first to offer it to tourists. Also, the European Union has been assisting heavily the Balkans, the Western Balkans, to face pandemic with, with Brussels acting as the first supplier of aid against COVID. But somehow, in local perception, the erosion of European Union credibility to, due to the recurrent delays in the accession process seems to prevail. The Kosovo issue remains unresolved, while the normalization process between Belgrade and Pristina is in need of new momentum. Following a year of silence, last year economic normalization agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, brokered by the Trump administration, brought the US back into the Balkans. Was the move motivated only by electoral purposes, or will America continue to somehow compete with the European Union over the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue? These are some of the topics, some of the questions today's conference will try to shed the light upon. I'm very, very glad that former UN Special Envoy to the Balkans, Karl Bildt, and the European Union Special Representative for the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue, Miroslav Lajcak, accepted our invitation. I'm grateful to them as well to all the other prominent speakers that will follow, and I'm pleased to leave the floor to Tim Judah, Balkan correspondent of The Economist. We will run the opening conversation. You have the floor, Tim. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you very much for that um, introduction, which uh, lays out uh, basically what we're going to talk about. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, the, 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 the Trump deal, in inverted commas, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't that long ago, but actually it really seems a long time ago, um, in, in, in Balkan terms anyway. Um, what we've decided is that we're going to start with um, Miroslav Lajcak, uh, uh, because uh, as the um, special representative of the EU for the uh, belgrade pristina uh, dialogue, and then we're going to sort of widen things out to the rest of the region with um, Karl Bildt. Um, uh, I say that the Trump thing was really a long time ago. I mean, it felt like a long time ago. There was a sort of lot of fuss about it, and there was a sort of lot of dust in the air, and that sort of uh, cleared. But the recently, in the last couple of weeks, the dust in the air of, over the Balkans has been about um, these so-called non-papers, these strange papers which have been uh, circulating and uh, variously ascribed to uh, the, um, the the Prime Minister of Slovenia or his office, uh, and then a second one ascribed to uh, French and German oh. diplomats, all, all denied, of course, but all, but both of them proposing, well, the first one proposing uh, the destruction of Bosnia and the creation of a greater Serbia and a greater uh, uh, Croatia and a greater um, um, Albania. And, and the second one, the one ascribed to the French and Germans, which they have denied, um, um, kind of rather more seriously, but proposing some sort of autonomous region for the Serbian inhabited north of Kosovo, um, and not quite talking about recognition by Serbia of Kosovo. I mean, what is going on here? I mean, you're at the center of events. Can you tell us what, what are these papers? Are they serious? You know, what, what's, what's going on here? 
Yes, uh, there has been some kind of proliferation of non-papers, and uh, of course there are discussions about about what's in those papers and why. I don't want to comment on the papers, but I, I want to address the question why uh, these non-papers appear, why now, and uh, what's behind them. And particularly I want to look at uh, the first one, namely the idea of uh, redrawing the borders in the Balkans uh, has been, uh, of course, it's not, not a new idea. It has been here uh, for many years, but uh, uh, somehow was brought to the forefront now. Uh, I deeply disagree with this idea. I consider it extremely dangerous, and I think that this is a war-provoking idea, let alone the fact that uh, with the implementation of this idea, we would be fulfilling the dream uh, joint, jointly dreamt by Mr. Milosevic and Tujman, and this is not something we want to do. Now, uh, uh, so I, this must be rejected, and this was uh, very clearly and strongly rejected, uh, particularly by the region. But the question is why it appears. Uh, and the answer here is that, unfortunately, the, the vision of European membership uh, for the Western Balkans has become more blurred and more distant and, uh, and therefore also less motivating. And, and that's why, you know, uh, uh, as we so, sort of are uh, creating a void in, in the region, others are coming with other ideas. So for me, there is no competition there is, uh, to the plan A, which is the enlargement. Of the, uh, of the European Union and accepting of the Western Balkans country. But uh, we, we must also know that there is no room for complacency. And if we are not serious with the plan A, then people would come with the plan B. And this is exactly what uh, this, this, this first paper is about. Do you know who's behind these papers? Look, I'm not here to speculate. I, 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 I I, I, I think I, I can say uh, reasonably uh, precisely who is behind, but that's not my role. I'm not here the, the representing you know, the speculations. As I, I'm saying, there are people who do believe that the solution for the Balkans is uh, uh, in redrawing the borders. But I'm saying that this is what, the, as I said, Milosevic and Tujman or Stalin uh, uh, and, and, and Molotov uh, with Ribertron we're, we're doing, and we know what the consequences were, and that's definitely not the path we should be inspired with. Okay. Um, you've been meeting, um, I think, in the, in the last week, both the president of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, and Albin Kurti, um, the prime minister of Kosovo, who's um, back for another go at being prime minister um, after a short after a short break. Um, worryingly, I would have thought for you, Mr. Kurti has been repeating you know, to anyone who wants to listen, that um, the dialogue is not his government's um, priority. You know, but fine, is that just for the public? Or what does he say to you in private? What does this mean? And of course, um, before uh, the Trump, um, before before the fall of his uh, first government, there was this sort of great fuss about the, um, the, the 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 idea of reciprocity, whereby Kosovo implied the same implied the same rules to Serbia as Serbia applied to Kosovo, especially when it comes to imports and exports and um, uh, paperwork. And um, there's been loose talk about that uh, returning. Do you think that will return? And um, if so, is that the end of your mission in a way? What's happening? Look, I uh, served as uh, my country's minister long enough for 10 years uh, uh, to learn that uh, it's not you choosing your priorities, it's the priorities choosing you. And uh, and this goes for the dialogue as well. Dialogue is the, the priority or one of the priorities for every government in uh, Kosovo and in Serbia, because uh, their future in, and and. Uh, the plans uh, also in the economic and social area are clearly linked to the European agenda and the progress of the European agenda and the, and the road towards European agenda goes through the dialogue. So that's, that's what it is. Uh, that's one thing. Dialogue is not something standing uh, aside and you can, it, that can wait. Dialogue is present in every everything you do. If, you, if the priorities of uh, Prime Minister Kurti's government are jobs and justice, Jobs means economic progress. Can you think of economic progress without the progress of regional cooperation? Isn't the regional cooperation clearly linked to the European integration? Isn't the European uh, uh, integration clearly linked to the progress on the dialogue? So here we are. So we fully support uh, the priorities, jobs and justice, but we are also explaining to our colleagues and partners in, in, in Kosovo that all these, uh, uh, the success in all these agendas goes through the dialogue. Second, if uh, the, the 
the, the reference to reciprocity were mentioned. I took it, I took those more in the electoral context because they were they were mentioned sort of as a mean to establish equality. But let me say that the, it's exactly the dialogue under the European Union facilitation, which is the only platform where Kosovo and Serbia meet on equal footing. They are equal parties to the dialogue and they are equally benefiting from the progress or equally suffering from the lack of, of, of a progress. And we did see uh, tariffs being introduced uh, uh, under, the, the, under the name or of, of reciprocity. Who benefited from, from that? No one. So, uh, you know, I am in favor of reciprocity if it means removing all possible uh, barriers, but not reciprocity by erecting new walls uh, that are obstructing the free movement of people, you know, and, and capital and, and, and services and everything that comes with it. So, uh, uh, I mean, the answer to your question is clearly the dialogue, because dialogue has delivered uh, uh, so much uh, to Kosovo and also to Serbia, and there is no way around and that's why, uh, and I think the meetings we had last week here in Brussels with both President Vucic and Prime Minister Kurti uh, were very clear and very uh, exact in, in this context. They heard it from everyone, uh, and those who needed to be convinced, I think, are not, do not need to be convinced anymore. Uh, okay, but you have to convince the region and, uh, and, and the rest of Europe that the Brussels Agreement okay, was in 2013, but following that, uh, you know, some of it's been some of it's been applied. Some of the agreements have uh, have been applied, and some of the subsequent agreements have been applied. But uh, quite a lot has not. But you've said repeatedly that you think it's really possible to see a deal being struck. But what, why should a deal be? Why should it be possible to to strike a deal now, as opposed to in five years' time or in ten years' time? And you. In, the, in that case, what, what, what will it look like? You know, what has changed to make you think that a deal is possible? And at the end of the day, how is it possible if Serbia will not recognise Kosovo's independence? And they've been very clear. Serbia's been very clear. It will never recognise Kosovo's independence. I mean, there are ways to do it. To the so-called two Germany's, uh, two Germany's um, model. But, uh, you know, why do you think it's going to happen and do you think it's going to happen and what's it going to look like? And my answer would be, why not now? Um, who is winning what by, by dragging their feet? I mean, uh, this is a dialogue on normalization of relations. This is the dialogue that has uh, already delivered lots of con concrete positive results. Serbia has uh, progressed on its European way. Serbia is a candidate country that wants to uh, open all chapters and wants to start closing chapters. Uh, Kosovo, obviously, for, for Kosovo, the success of the dialogue means uh, again becoming the, the candidate country and, and everything that comes with it. Kosovo has uh, uh, you know, seen uh, since the beginning of the dialogue a number of very concrete results. As I, I can mention the regional representation where Kosovo represents itself. Uh, collection of taxes, uh, freedom of movement, integration of, of police and judiciary from the north. Uh, and, and there are many other examples. Far from ideal, I cannot say everything is, uh, be, uh, has been implemented 100%. There is still a lot of work to do. But it, the, all this was uh, only possible thanks to the dialogue, and there is no way you uh, can achieve this outside of the dialogue. So the normalization of relations is something that uh, both Kosovo and Serbia need. The region will benefit, and of course, the European future of the, reg of, of the region will benefit from. So uh, uh, as I said, uh, waiting for later uh, means nothing. It means that you are only postponing the solution of the issue, or addressing the issue that must be addressed. And, and there is no better way to how to address it, uh, uh, but through the dialogue. So uh, it is doable. It requires political will. It requires political will in Pristina, in Belgrade, but of course, it also requires, and very much so, the political commitment and the active role of the European Union. And when I'm speaking about the European Union's role, I'm not speaking about my personal commitment, which is here, but also the serious approach of the member states, because it's uh, linked to the European perspective. And the European perspective is something that it's not Miroslav Lajcek who gives uh, to the parties, but it's the member states. And, and this, is, this is my message to the member states. Do you think it's going to happen in the next year? 
Look, I'm not, uh, again, uh, I always, I never speculate about the, the timelines. Uh, and of course, I don't want to uh, speculate about the, the, the when and what, what will be the, the final outcome. My mandate is very clear. I am here to facilitate uh, the, uh, the agreement, comprehensive legally binding agreement on the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia, an agreement that will uh, solve all outstanding issues. That means the, the, the ones that have not been addressed yet, and also those that have been addressed, you refer to it, but have not been fully implemented. And uh, it, is, uh, it is definitely achievable, but of course the process is in the hands of the parties. We are here, I'm here 24-7, uh, so I'm, uh, we are, can proceed as fast as the parties are ready and willing to. So this is, uh, th that's why we should not speculate right now. The most important outcome of the visits last week was the commitment that the partners will meet uh, within uh, several weeks. Uh, for the first meeting in person to define or to redefine the agenda of the dialogue so that the process can continue. And this is what we are fully focused at. So I don't know whether I lost you or you lost me or we lost him. We lost Milan, I think. Uh -huh. Tim, can you hear? Miroslav, you can hear me? Yes, I can. I'm sorry, I'm totally sorry. My, my line seems to have dropped, but um, okay. now I'm back. Okay. okay good. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, well, th thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, d I didn't hear the last, the last like line of what of what you said. I, I, um, I was scared that I, you I, were so shocked of what what I said that you were unable to respond. But then I realized that you were <laughs> not frozen. No, 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 certainly not. But um, th thank you, thank you very much indeed. I mean, this is we could actually go on for a, a lot longer, but unfortunately, we don't have um, a, a, we don't have uh, more time. So I'm going to say thank you to you for the moment, and now I'm going to move to to car built uh who's had obviously a kind of uh, a, a long experience of, of the region um and uh, and you've been maintaining your your interest in the region and, and actually uh recently you've been proposing a much tougher i mean now uh, a, a much tougher pushback against Russia in, in, in the region. But let me put it to you that uh, surely the success of Serbia in procuring vaccines and being a vaccine leader proves that the policy of Mr. Vucic is right. It's not to sort of pursue the European path, but literally to play off everybody against each other. I think that um, Mr. Vucic was, well, we know that Mr. Vucic was in Brussels uh, only a, a only uh, last week, where I think he secured a, a, a grant for um, building a motorway. Uh, surely the, the, this policy is right. It means play off the EU, the US, China, uh, Russia, and you can secure big gains. I mean, surely the rest of the region was just sort of passive and, and waited for help and ended up with very little and, until now, except very publicly Serbia, which has done, has had, or Mr. Vucic, who's had a very good uh, COVID uh, crisis. So surely Mr. Vucic is is right, and it's it, uh, 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 and uh, perhaps we're wrong in looking at thinking of everybody meddling in the region. But actually, it's Serbia, especially, but other countries too, when they can, playing off all the powers against each other to secure the best deals for themselves. And Serbia is obviously the best at it. Well, I think a situation where all of the countries of the region are playing each other off uh, is going to end in tears. Uh, that's fairly obvious. And, and, and if you look at the trajectory of Serbia during the last, say, 20 decades or two decades or something like that, I, I think we can agree that Serbia has made less progress than all of us would have hoped uh, would have been uh, good for the region as well. Short term, I agree with you. You can play off. You can sort of secure a couple of vaccines here and there and do some short term things. But in order for Serbia to be a credible candidate for membership of the European Union, you need to establish strategic credibility among the other member states of the European Union. I'm not quite certain that Mr. Vucic has done that. I think he has diluted the message of where Serbia is heading. And um, from the wider strategic perspective, I don't think that's been to the benefit of the long-term evolution 
of Serbia. Uh, that has not only to do with these things that you mentioned, but there are other aspects of Serbian politics that you can bring into the, uh, the picture as well. Okay. Uh, like Mr. Lajcik, you too were um, the high representative in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So let's kind of look specifically at, at Bosnia here. Um, it's more than a quarter of a century now that, 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 that you were at, at, at Dayton and then went on to, as I say, to be um, high representative. But still, it's, I mean, a quarter of a century and with or without outside Bosnian leaders are unable or unwilling to like, strike a deal to make the country uh, more functional. And a quarter of a century later, really, I don't think anyone has any new ideas. But uh, you wrote a paper recently in which you proposed what you said, you, you called it a more forward EU vision for Bosnia. And that sounds great, but what is it? What is a more forward vision? It is, um, it is the European Union sticking to the strategic decision that it made in 2003 on enlargement and, and doing that forcefully and with credibility. What has been happening, and we all know that, is that uh, that has not really been the case. I mean, you mentioned the 2013 agreement that's for the, the, the Serbia-Kosovo. Uh, what happened thereafter is, of course, that particular Juncker Commission lost the focus on the Balkans and then things started to drift and, and, and we've seen subsequently, we've seen the blocking of North Macedonia, Albania. Uh, we've seen a couple of different things. We've seen the blocking of Kosovo uh, visa freedom. The credibility of the enlargement process has been eroded. That impacts upon Bosnia as well. Because Bosnia, is, it's a complicated place, to put it very mildly. Um, there were, no one had any illusions it's going to be a, a, an easy place. I've, I've said in the paper that we refer to, I, I said that Bosnia is, after all, it's, it's far better than Cyprus, is not yet Belgium. Uh, Belgium is not working as smoothly as Sweden or Denmark or whatever. It's a bloody complicated place as well. Uh, but it's somewhat better than Bosnia, but Bosnia is significantly better than Cyprus, which is another sort of complicated place if you look at the setup. Uh, so it's a slow thing of moving it. Um, and I would say that moving Bosnia in the right direction is dependent upon a credible framework, and that credible framework of its integration. If that framework loses in credibility, I mean, make one comparison. We saw what happened a couple of weeks ago on the streets of Belfast, um, where sort of cars were starting to burn again. The Good Friday Agreement was dependent upon the framework that was there in the form of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland being in the same European Union. With that gone, you see things happening. You see things, things starting to fray and cars starting to burn in the streets of Belfast. I'm not going to say that that's going to happen in the Balkans immediately, but, but I think it's fairly obvious that if we don't have the Balkans moving forward, there's a severe risk of it starting to slide backwards. And moving forward is dependent upon a more forceful engagement by member states in the enlargement process. I think they have lost the strategic direction. Perhaps one could even say that they've gone brain dread on, 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 on the Balkans by uh, allowing this sort of weakening of the enlargement process. Do you think that message is getting through or do people just like... In, in ministries and chanceries across Europe? Do they go, just don't talk to me about the Balkans. I've got bigger problems to, to deal with. I, I, was struck by, I was struck by one thing. That's the United Kingdom. It's outside the European Union these days. But, I mean, the United Kingdom has been heavily engaged in the Balkans for a very long time. Uh, but if you, if you read the integrated review, uh, and the Europe section where they mention all sorts of different parts of Europe, but there's not a single word about the Balkans. And uh, I, that's not unique for London. Um, you see that interest in Balkan affairs have gone down. Um, you might say, of course, there are other things in the world that sort of uh, we need to give attention to. I'm, I'm all in favor of that. But, but they, there's no question. Um, uh, we will have Chancellor Merkel leaving. Uh, she has taken an active interest. We saw the German foreign ministers uh, touring around the Balkans the other last week or last few days. That's good. Uh, but otherwise, there's no question of the fact that it's been sliding down the list of priorities. 
in a way that uh, has made it more difficult also to sort out, say, the North Macedonia blockage or, or the other things. I mean, they, they are saying, okay, that's it. Uh, let's move to the next agenda item. And uh, that opens up for other actors and that opens up for things starting to slide backwards. I'm exaggerating slightly for the sake of the argument. Going back to what Miroslav says, uh, if plan A doesn't work or loses credibility, then paha, you have plan B. The non-paper is on the table. I don't think it's going to happen immediately. It's highly dangerous but it might start to slide towards plan B. Everyone is saying that they don't agree with that paper, but everyone who has been dealing with the Balkans know that there are quite a number of people around who agrees with that paper. Um, we, we don't have very much time left. We've only got a, a, a couple of minutes, but um, as you said, the, the, the lack of um, European credibility opens the doors to others. And, and that's part of this, the idea of this discussion today to talk about geopolitics in the region. And that's usually code for talking about what are the Russians up to? What are the Chinese up to? What are the Arabs up to? What are the Turks up to? And so on and so on. Um, let me put it to you that we used to talk about the Europeanization of the Balkans. But in fact, what we're seeing now and, and what uh, and a reason for the one of the reasons for the declining credibility of the EU within the region is because what we're really seeing is Balkanization of parts of the EU. And by that, I mean, in a way, adopting perhaps Balkan standards of political meddling and justice and, 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 and media in EU countries like Hungary and Poland and not the adoption of European, supposed European standards in the Balkans. So surely there's no way to, 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 to open this sort of uh, forward EU vision um, if, if the EU itself can't deal with a sort of balkanization of uh, certain countries within the EU? Well, I don't think you should blame the... You can blame the Balkans for a lot of mess, but you can't blame it for... I, I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying that certain standards of, uh, are being adopted in EU countries, Balkan standards. I don't think, with due respect to the issues that we have with Poland and Hungary, I, I don't think they are necessarily the ones that are impairing the credibility of the enlargement process. Uh, it is more that the, the major actors in, in, uh, in the EU, uh, be that Paris, be that Berlin, be that Madrid, be that Rome, uh, that they have sort of lost that interest in driving the process forward. I mean, they accept the enlargement process in there. They tick the box at the uh, foreign affairs meeting now and then. Uh, but the engagement in the Balkans has uh, has gone down. And uh, that is reflected in the fact that momentum isn't there to the same extent. And then other actors, it's not that Russia or Turkey or others are strong actors in the Balkans, but if the EU, everything is relative in life. If the EU becomes weaker, then they, by definition, become somewhat stronger without being particularly strong. Uh, the problem in the Balkans isn't really external actors. The problems in the Balkans is that history starts to reassert itself. And history can be a very difficult thing, not only in the Balkans, but certainly in the Balkans. Well, thank you very much. Uh uh, we really could be talking about this for the next um, couple of hours, but unfortunately, our, our section of, the, of this uh, today's discussion um, has come to an end. To you and to uh, Mr. Lychak. And um, I, I'm now going to give the floor to Giorgio Fruscione, who's a research fellow at uh, ISPI, and you're going to introduce the um, our next panel and to moderate the dis discussion. And so thank you very much. And over to you, Georgia.
Good afternoon. Uh, sorry for waiting this uh, few minutes. Uh, thank you to Team Juda and thank, thanks both to Karl Bildt and uh, Miroslav Lajcak for their inspiring uh, views and comments on the geopolitics of the Balkans. Let's now move on to the second session. My name is Giorgio Fruscione. I'm a ESP Research Fellow and I will moderate this session where we will present the latest ESP report on the Balkans called the pandemic in the Balkans, geopolitics and democracy at stake. The report was edited by me. It was published on uh, ESP website about a month ago and uh, you can download it for free. The main idea behind the report was to highlight how geopolitics and uh, internal politics in the Balkans are interconnected and how they changed or didn't change during the pandemic. Alongside me today, there are some of the authors of this report and uh, as well as other distinguished guests uh, whom I will now briefly introduce. So, Tena Prelet, uh, research fellow of the Department of Politics and uh, International Relations at the University of Oxford. Tena, good afternoon and welcome. Richard Turcani, Program uh, Director of the Central European Institute of Asian Studies. Uh, Richard, I hope I pronounced it correctly, your name and surname, and you're welcome. Jovan Amarovic, Executive Director of the Think Tank Political Network uh, uh, from Montenegro. Good afternoon, Jovana. Gentiola Madi, Associated Researcher of the European Movement Albania and uh, Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa. Welcome, Gentiola and Dimitar Bechev, Director of the European Policy Institute. Good afternoon, Dimitar. Hello. Before, before starting the first round of questions, uh, I would like to kindly ask uh, of uh, all of uh, our speakers to keep their answers to five minutes. In the end, if time permits, we will also collect some questions from the audience. And uh, let me start off with uh, Tena Prelet. Uh, who together with uh, Nikolaus Tsifakis is author of the first chapter of our report, uh, in which they focus on the geopolitical competition in the Western Balkans. So, Tena, can you please give us a general overview of uh, the Balkans' main uh, geopolitical uh, dynamics uh, since the pandemic outbreak? Sure, thank you, Giorgio. Uh, so I think that the pandemic has uh, really exposed a very interesting geopolitical situation in the Western Balkans, but I would argue that it has uh, rather exposed and amplified some dynamics that were already be present beforehand, rather than opening new themes. So uh, so to say, you know, it has put under a magnifying lens uh, uh, geopolitical dynamics that were already present before. So let's start at the beginning, at uh, spring uh, 2020. Uh, it was clear since, uh, since since then that the Balkans presented very specific vulnerabilities in terms of their exposure to the risks presented by the pandemic. Um, Western Balkan states have uh, by and large very weak health systems. They also have uh, elderly populations. Um, so it was clear that EU help was, was crucial in that respect. And that uh, if the EU wanted to be a real geopolitical player uh, and not the playground, as stated by the EU's high representative for foreign affairs and security policy, Joseph Borrell, that the EU needed to intervene and really help out the Balkans in this conjuncture. Now, uh, the EU's help did come through eventually. Um, the EU represents by far the single most important donor of health assistance during the pandemic. Uh, its total value exceeded 3.3 billion euro. And really, it was a very um, multifaceted package that also included mitigation of uh, the socioeconomic impact, the economic recovery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet, uh, as often happens, uh, the EU's help was slow. Uh, and uh, by sending mixed messages. Uh, it was quite uncoordinated. So uh, it is really good that uh, in this moment we have the Commissioner for Neighbourhood and Enlargement touring the region and saying and making this big show of solidarity and saying we're with you. Um, but it is May 2021. It is 14 months into the pandemic. So I think that the consensus is by and large that the first few months uh, that were very, uh, of course, troublesome also for, for the EU itself, um, were kind of lost uh, in terms of communicating the EU's help to the Western Balkans. And uh, in parallel, something that often ha happens also on the other side in terms of these uh, 
foreign actors uh, or non-Western actors in the Western Balkans. Um, as we see also very often in other contexts, um, uh, actors such as China and Rus Russia have the luxury to be able to send a much quicker and more unitary message uh, than the EU. And this was felt uh, within the population through the amplification of this message by the local elites. So we saw that the mask diplomacy by China um, in uh, spring 2020 resonated a lot, especially in Serbia. We had those uh, shows of gratitude, the, those billboards with thank you, brother C. We had uh, President Alexander Vucic kissing the Chinese flag, etc., etc. And uh, uh, through this uh, second um, stage of the vaccine diplomacy, we also have uh, the presence of uh, Russian and Chinese vaccines, again, uh, much, uh, um, I mean, most of all uh, in Serbia. And really, I think that uh, if we can pinpoint a new dynamic, it is this fact that China has uh, uh, presented itself not only as an economic actor in the Balkans, because so far the economic narrative was by and large the dominant one, but it has also presented itself as a soft power um, actor. So this is really the, the, the one a new thing. And in terms of the EU's presence, as, uh, as I said, it was substantial. Uh, so we cannot say that it was too little too late, because arguably it is not too little. But we need to, uh, to do some self-criticism and say that it was too late and also too unclear, perhaps. Um, so how does that reflect in terms of the opinion polls in the Balkans? Um, a recent opinion poll that uh, the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group did uh, in last uh, autumn uh, showed that really the majority of people in the Western Balkans is still inclined towards the EU and towards the EU perspective of the Western Balkans. And yet, in some ways, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, show of help from uh, other countries really did make an impact. And I think the main you know, thing to note here is that this geopolitical sitting on many stools policy by Serbia uh, came to fruition in a very practical way for the first time. So for the first time, the citizens of Serbia and also of the wider region have felt uh, the benefits of this policy, of this foreign policy by Serbia. Uh, and I think that the one really dispiriting takeaway from, from all these uh, dynamics is that uh, in a way there is the sense that if you play by the rules, you lose. There is a sense that in this uh, situation, a semi-authoritarian type of uh, uh, leadership of government has managed to sort out an emergency situation in a better way than those around it. So I think that this is potentially dispiriting news for democracy uh, and for actors who are inclined towards democratic values including the EU, and it is a call that needs to be heeded. Thank you, Tena, and uh, I absolutely agree that uh, these dynamics were already present uh, before the pandemic. And thank you also for mentioning uh, the perception from, uh, from the Balkans. And we, we will go back to that, but uh, let me turn now on the role of China with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Richard Turchani. Uh, Richard, what is China's ultimate goal in the region? Uh, is it true that the Chinese soft power in the Balkans, and particularly in Serbia, will serve as a Trojan horse for uh, further penetration uh, in Europe? Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, let me start by saying what is uh, not China's ultimate goal. Um, because uh, very often there are misperceptions. Uh, I'll also come to the Trojan horse uh, point. But first of all, China is not in Western Balkans for charity. Right? China is not a Santa Claus going around the world uh, giving uh, free gifts, building bridges for free and uh, building factories for free and so on. Um, and obviously this sounds uh, natural, but uh, when you listen to politicians or even to media sometimes and you know, to, to the discourse, you sometimes get pictured that people imagine China doing exactly this. Um, so, of course, China is in Western Balkans for its own interests. And uh, as the previous speaker said, uh, these interests are both economic, but also political. And um, actually, as someone who follows Chinese foreign policy, let me just say that um, for the Chinese Communist Party, politics is always the eventual goal. So economy is a tool and politics is the goal. So. Um, it's good to keep in mind that also what China would be doing in Western Balkans eventually should somehow benefit Chinese Communist Party politically at home. 
Um, so rejecting this obvious uh, nonsense claim that China is uh, providing charity uh, sometimes slips into the other extreme, and uh, that is exactly the Trojan horse. Uh, this course, um, which basically suggests that China wants to prevent Western Balkans from joining the EU, that it wants to spread authoritarian and undermine democracy in the region, um, and may maybe establish some kind of regional hegemony in Western Balkans. Now, let me say why this is um, not accurate, in my opinion. First of all, China doesn't have power to do so. Um, all too often, China's um, power is exaggerated in Africa, um, in East Asia, in Western Balkans. Economically speaking, um, no matter what it may seem in the media, but China is far behind other established actors. And if you look beyond economy um, in terms of politics or even military, China is really not a player in, in the region yet. And it's difficult to imagine that China would be a military actor in Western Balkans. Um, secondly, there is little China could achieve, for instance, if Western Balkans stays out of the EU. I mean, you know, let's imagine that Serbia joins the EU. And uh, I would argue that for China, it's much better to have such a friendly country within the EU because it could help um, influence internal EU decision-making. Uh, obviously, EU foreign policy uh, can be vetoed by any power. So actually, I would argue for China, it would be much better to have Serbia inside the EU rather than outside the EU. Uh, finally, um, and that was mentioned by, by previous two speakers, um, China is not the reason why Europeanization of Western Balkans um, so somehow got into a problematic situation. Um, but what, what's happening is China's gravity, and I think the word gravity is really how we can imagine it, that China may have some goals, which I have now pre presented, which I have presented that China may not want to undermine democracy in this country, but China has certain gravity. And as a result of this gravity, China is allowing, in some cases, for instance, corrupted regional elites to go on with their business without feeling the need to reform. I mean, Montenegro might be an example with the bridge project, um, other infrastructure projects in Bosnia, but especially in Serbia might be another reason, might be another example, be it with environmental standards or with, uh, with other uh, other standards. So to finish up, um, I've said what I think China is not up to in Western Balkans. So very briefly, what does China want? China wants to be counted as one of the great powers in the region. And uh, actually, to, to be a little provocative, I think China is more interested in the status. China wants to be respected as a great power in the region um, more than kind of having actually, you know, the, the economic, political, or military uh, basis for this, uh, for this uh, position. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for uh, focusing on the uh, Chinese interest uh, in, the, in the region. And uh, when we are about that, uh, let's see uh, more in concrete what does this look like. Uh, and I will ask uh, to Jovana Marovic, uh, because Jovana, in, in recent weeks uh, we have seen how geopolitically dangerous uh, China's financial assistance to a country as tiny as Montenegro can be, as Podgorica will have to pay off uh, its billion euro debt to uh, Chinese Exim Bank for the construction of the Bar Bollare motorway. And the European Union has already said that it will not help Montenegro in its uh, loan payment to China. Uh, do you think that was the right call? Thanks, Giorgio. Well, as Dan already said, the EU is sending mi mixed messages about the geopolitical situation, about the role of the um, third actors in the Western Balkans, but also regarding the highway project in Montenegro. What we have now in Montenegro is not shift in the, in the policy towards China. It's uh, because of the change of the government, which happened after the elections during the August last year. 
And now we have the new government, which is trying to fix the, the problems in the budget uh, regarding the financial situation in the country, trying to, to, to solve this issue in order to, to, to deal with the democratization of the country. And uh, the, the, what is, um, you know, like previous government was uh, positive about the role of China and about the highway project. They presented it as the project of the century. So they were really positive about the highway project and everything. And they are res responsible for the conditions and for the contract and everything which is now happening in Montenegro. And um, yes, the new government has to pay the, the, the first uh, the part of the loan and the deadline is at end of June. So that's why the vice president of, of, the, of the government asked the EU in Brussels two months ago to repay loan uh, uh, and to help Montenegro dealing with this really pressing issue. So the, the reaction from the EU level was, as I said, um, there were mixed reactions. The first one came from the spokeswoman, the EU spokeswoman. She said that the, and that message was misunderstood by the local media. And that's why there were lots of reactions from the EU level. So local media actually reported that the EU is ready to repeal the loan. And then there were lots of re the other reactions, for example, from the commissioner from neighbor for neighborhood and enlargement. And then he said that the, uh, the EU will not, and he, he, it does not pay the loans of the third parties, but that the EU is communicated uh, communicating with the government and trying to find solution on daily basis. There was the same message during today's visit into Montenegro. Uh, we we don't know what will be this new uh, solution or what they are trying to, to to communicate and to agree on. But as as I said, the messages are different, even though uh, from the government uh, itself, because. Um, uh, the government is criticizing, of course, the contract and the previous government and everything. But at the same time, they are trying to, to negotiate new deals and new um, new contracts and new projects with China. So Montenegro is in desperate need of money. And they are trying to, to, to uh, as I said, cooperate and communicate well with China. But at the same way, they are aware of, of negative consequences of the current highway project trying to, to, to uh, somehow convince the EU that they should step in. And why should the EU step in? Uh, and why should the EU help Montenegro in, uh, in this uh, concrete project and, and problem? Because in that way, uh, the EU will show that it cares about the Western Balkans, that the enlargement process is alive, and that uh, dealing with the most pressing issue, they actually are helping, among, uh, helping Montenegro and the Western Balkans, not leaving them to the potential negative uh, political influences from the third parties, China and the rest, of course. That should be the signal for, for the other countries that they can um, somehow, um, uh, that they can uh, count on, on the EU and their help in this whole process. Then potential new loan provided by the EU is also in some way a um, good deal for the EU, not just for Montenegro. And then at the end, it's this new, this whole uh, project and the contract and conditions and everything which which are which is problematic when it comes to the highway project in Montenegro. That's not the responsibility of the current government, but the previous one. And if the EU wants to help Montenegro in the democratization uh, process, they should help the new government in order to, to be able to focus on the democratization. So there are many reasons why the EU should care about the highway project and, and, and problems in Montenegro and the rest of the Western Balkans but I'm not quite sure that they actually will help in this concrete case. Thank you, Jovana, and uh, we will come back to the regime change that happened uh, in Montenegro in the second round of, que or second round of questions. And uh, thank you for mentioning also the enlargement process. And about this, I would like to uh, ask uh, Gentiola Maddi. Uh, Gentiola, as uh, we are focusing on uh, current affairs, I would like to ask you to comment on the results of the 
uh, Albanian uh, parliamentary elections in which Prime Minister Edi Rama's Socialist Party gained a majority. In particular, I would like to ask you whether this election could have any effect on uh, uh, Tirana's EU integration path. Thank you, Giorgio. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, for the first time since the fall of communism, there was a political party in Albania that got the third mandate. It has never happened before. But uh, if we see the terms of numbers, Rama got 74 seats in the parliament out of 140, which is the same number of seats that he got even the previous election. So we didn't have any influx of, of votes at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, a, a significant one. The two, two elements or two points that uh, were in favor of Rama uh, were exactly the vaccine campaign uh, under which the government is pushing uh, strongly, hardly. Up to, up to now, we have like more than half a million of doses administered uh, as of yesterday, which is quite significant if you consider that more or less we have almost two million people living in Albania and most of the other uh, residing abroad. Then the other point in, in his favor was management of post-earthquake of November 2019. Exactly a year ago, um, the Donor Conference pledges were be went beyond the, the every expectation of the government, but also the general public. So um, at the end of the day, the, the elections beyond these two considerations didn't bring up any uh, real alternative. So the, the political parties that, uh, uh, that were part of the, the, the elections are the same one, the leaders didn't change. So we have kind of a repetition of the same environment. But um, what brought the socialists in favor again is also that different from the other parties, they managed over the years to eradicate more within the communities in order to have a wider knowledge, which are the main topics or what are the people, what the people want to hear. So the promises, let's say, were made, uh, made up as for specific uh, realities. But uh, there is another important element that we have to mention, considering the geopolitical situation, uh, Rama's forged friend, personal friendship with, uh, with Erdogan, Turkish president. It is important because beyond the considerations on uh, the fact that this personal friendship blurs the line between interstate relations and, and private personal matters, um, Erdogan at the, at the beginning of, of January um, provided a New Year gift, let, let's call it like that, to, to, to Rama, and it was exactly building a regional hospital for free uh, in Fier, which is in the central Albania, and it was quite uh, needed. So that, that was a plus, let's say, in, in his favor. Moreover, we have uh, uh, the intermediation role that Turkey uh, undertook uh, for the jabs to bring them to Albania especially the Chinese uh, jabs. So even here, um, the, the, the personal ties brought, brought about new developments. And uh, not the less, it's also the building of 500 uh, apartments uh, destroyed during the, the earthquake of November. So um, if we see the, the, the electoral campaign in Albania uh, from another point of view, we have to, to see that, uh, that the leaders of all the political parties uh, dealt a lot with mutual accusations and denigration of the counterpart and not about uh, main problems, uh, real uh, issues driven by the needs of the country. And this, to a certain extent, there was a considerable number of, of votes, 80,000 votes that were invalid, which shows to a certain extent that there is a considerable portion of the citizens that are really um, disengaged and disillusioned with the, the current political situation. And let's say this amount of invalid votes, it's almost equivalent to eight seats in the parliament. And uh, regarding the, the elections and the EU integration, exactly, they were a test case. They were, uh, the elections were seen as the last precondition uh, by the Commission for Albania to, uh, to open up effectively the accession negotiations. Uh, the yesterday news that started circulating in the media that the Commission wants to bring forward the proposal to uh, open the, the first intergovernmental conference with Albania during June, it's quite significant and plays in favor of the government. Um, so it shows that there is uh, this intention to, to go forward with Albania's integration pathway. But on the other hand, we have not to forget that the election process, as the other ones in the previous uh, rounds, 
uh, encountered several deficiencies, such as allegations of vote buying, the use of public administration by the governing uh, party for electoral purposes, uncontrolled electoral campaigning online, as, as well as the abuse with personal data, the, 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 the scandal uh, that um, emerged a few days before the elections. Overall, however, overall, the, 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 let's say the internationals considered the, the voting process as more or less smooth, better than the previous ones. So, um, so far, it looks like uh, we are going ahead with uh, the, the, the accession and ne negotiations. Uh, but the, the only pending issue at the moment in Albania is the um, non-recognition of the elections by the opposition and the visit of the uh, commissioner uh, in the next days, uh, although the, the purpose was not exactly uh, dealing with elections, but it may be that this topic come, comes about in the, in the discussion uh, with the representative of the political parties. So we have to see uh, to what extent this will change. We have to mention, uh, finally, that the, the new government will take uh, the seat uh, in September, so the parliament is still running until July. The, the current one, and um, there are some hot issues that are being discussed at the moment, but we don't know to what extent they are just um, momentary, momentarily issues, or they are going to bring up uh, new uh, significant changes in the political situation. Uh, it remains the biggest challenge for Albania, but also for the reason, the facade democracy, so dealing exactly and seriously uh, with the um, the um, political polarization, dealing with the conclusion of the justice reform in the case of Albania, uh, the um, effective work of the constitutional court on the hot dossiers, which one, uh, which especially with the elections of 2019, where it was just the socialists running, or the, the vote buying of the 2017. And finally, the fight against corruption and other organized crime, the results of the latter ones will uh, if significantly uh, pay, uh, play a role for Albania's process and convince the members, the skeptical member states that the country is effectively committing to what it has promised so far. Thank you, Gentiola. Thank you for a very detailed uh, update about uh, the integration process of, uh, of Albania. And uh, I, I have to, to, to turn on now to uh, Dimitar Bechev, as uh, we have discussed the role of China and the EU in the region. So Dimitar, with you, I would like to move our att attention on Russia. And uh, uh, given Beijing's uh, uh, growing uh, uh, influence in the Balkans, do you think Moscow will change its approach in the region? Does Russia fear it may be replaced by China, by China in the Balkans? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, you're absolutely right that uh, China has stolen the show from Russia. Uh, Serbia would be a good example. I mean, there were billboards uh, with with she not with with Putin, even if um, Russia also sent personal protective equipment and other medical supplies. But one thing to appreciate about Russia is that um, its presence in the region is structural. Uh, and it's not there to uh, establish its dominance. Uh, it re is realist, uh, realistic about uh, the capabilities uh, it has at its disposal. Um, of course, as we've said uh, many times in those discussions, it sees itself as a spoiler, um, not as a replacement of the EU. And by same token, uh, China uh, is not really, really a problem. Um, Russia, um, at the same time, has caught some gains over the past uh, two years, despite um, the um, pandemic, which has shifted priorities. Uh, just to give you uh, one example, um, the Balkan Stream pipeline or Turk Stream 2 is now in operation. And in, indeed, uh, Serbia Gas has been talking to uh, the Republic of Srpska um, with regard to the extension. So policies that really matter matter to the Russians are making headway in project, um, and and China of course is in a different league because it has the money uh, to um, to splash around, but uh, Russia has its own assets, uh, and as long as China is an ally of sorts uh, beyond the Balkans, I don't think why Russia should uh, be be concerned uh, as it were. 
Um, we should also take into account, um, going back to your point, that of course Russia has um, lost uh, other some more ground uh, as well. Um, what happened in Serbia is also interesting because Serbia also went through elections, and one of the outcomes of the elections was the loss of influence by uh, the Socialist Party of Serbia of Ivica Dacic, which, uh, uh, as we know, has been one of the main pro-Russian. Uh, forces within the current situation. Of course, it's all shades of green. Everybody's pro-Russian, but uh, they they are different degrees to that. But back in the day, uh, Ivica Dacic's foreign minister had much greater leeway um, in setting policies. And now, as head of uh, speaker of the parliament, his executive functions are more limited, if if any. Uh, you've seen this power play at the level of ministries and state companies. Uh, the energy minister, Zoran Mihailovic, has put a lot of pressure on uh, Serbia gas, which for many years has been a fiefdom of the SPS. And uh, in that regard, a sort of uh, state within the state with lots of uh, Russian influence going on. Now, uh, Serbia gas uh, is under pressure to unbundle. Um, it's long-term director Dusan Bajatovic, who is late, late lieutenant to, um, to Dacic, might lose his job. Uh, there's been a shift of power. So the Russian lobby is not as, as powerful. Uh, but Russia is still there in Bosnia, which might become its main um, main asset in Republika Srpska. Nothing is moving with data, and Russia has the veto. Uh, and um, if there are new opportunities along the way, I'm sure there will be more Russian action. Uh, so what, what I see mostly is retrenchment, uh, which has been a longer process, even going back to Montenegro and, and North Macedonia's NATO membership. Uh, Ro- Russia might be taking a step back, but it's, it, it is bound to be around uh, in the region. Thank you, Dimitar. We really had to complete the geopolitical framework of the Balkans with the role of Russia. And uh, we are now moving to the second round of questions after this uh, first round on uh, more current events. I, I want to ask you to uh, answer uh, to three minutes, if you can. And uh, I will uh, now focus the questions on uh, topics uh, that were discussed uh, even in the uh, in the report. Uh, and uh, Tena, in the chapter you co-authored with uh, uh, Nikolaus Tsifakis, you analyze the Serbian pro-regime media, or better yet, uh, uh, tabloids. And in particular, you researched their role uh, in presenting Serbia as a regional leader through its uh, va- vaccination campaign. So this means that the topic uh, has both political and uh, geopolitical implications. Uh, could you please present uh, the main results of, uh, of your analysis? Sure, thanks for this introduction uh, of our work with Nikos Tsipakis, uh, whom we warmly um, say hi from, from here. Uh, so basically, um, I think one thing to highlight is really that the discourse around uh, uh, non-Western actors in the Western Balkans has by and large been very focused on the supply side of the problem at the beginning. Meaning, you know, the question, what is Russia doing in the Balkans? And then what is China doing in the Balkans? Whereas we have been much less focused at the beginning beginning on the demand side for it. So basically, what is it that local leaders, local politicians and local elites uh, are creating as a fertile uh, terrain for these uh, foreign actors to prosper? Uh, and I'm really glad that you know that uh, much more work is being done on this second issue and that it has been recognized by more and more you know, researchers and analysts as the key one. So if we look at the demand side for um, the action of China and Russia as uh, the key one, um, our argument is that it is not enough to look at the official statements uh, to understand what is the game played by the local elites. Um, And uh, the case of Serbia really is the uh, most interesting one in the context of the pandemic for all the reasons that we've explained so far, because uh, uh, the Vucic uh, regime has really been the most active one in playing off uh, EU, China, 
China, Russia, and other actors. So it is not enough to look at official statements. So where do you go? What do you look? Um, it is really interesting to look at pro-regime media. Why? Because uh, those local elites, they very often uh, play you know, a game in which the EU is addressed positively in official statements. But at the same time, they do undermine the pro-EU narrative in the country through these other methods, including through those pro-regime media. So what Nikos and I have done is to make a, a discourse analysis of uh, one specific pro-regime tabloid called the Informer and to analyze uh, all the articles under the tag vaccination, so a very uh, neutral one, uh, in the period from uh, uh, late December until the end of February uh, 2021. So what we have found uh, is an interesting set of, uh, uh, of issues and of findings. So first one is that the pro-vaccination, so the sensibilization of the country uh, to uh, actually go and get vaccinated was very much highlighted. And this is a difference in respect to the very beginning of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, where the leadership was sending much more mixed messages about the risks posed by this uh, uh, illness and uh, by, by the effectiveness of of vaccination. So quite clearly, there was, you know, the ground was being prepared for a, a very important and successful campaign of vaccination. Second one, uh, more geopolitically um, speaking, is that the EU uh, and specific EU countries are presenting, uh, presented in a very bad light. They're presenting as uh, uh, failing the test uh, of the pandemic. And specifically here, Germany and also Croatia, the country I'm from originally, is presented as the, as the biggest enemy in this sense. And also the uh, US administration, the Biden administration, is presented as, uh, as neg in a negative light. However, it's interesting also to note that not all EU leaders are presented uh, negatively. So, for instance, you know, it should not surprise us that uh, Orban uh, is, uh, um, is presented as an ally and also that the UK uh, is presented uh, in, a, in a better light uh, because the UK has uh, um, exited the EU. But also President Macron of uh, France, uh, of the enlargement skeptic France, we can say, and also somebody who has uh, cultivated very strong business links with Serbia lately is presented better. But uh, most of all, there is this theme of Serbia as winning uh, the, the vaccination and sort of the COVID crisis and the glorification of President Vucic as a sub-theme. So what is interesting to note is that whereas in the first time of the pandemic, as per previous studies have shown, uh, the responsibility of the contagion was uh, used to present really the citizens as the villains who undermine state measures of, uh, uh, set by the Serbian regime, and the China and Russia were portrayed as really the heroes of, uh, in the fight against the virus. In the second stage, at the vaccination stage, um, Russia and China are, yes, uh, seen in a positive light, but they are no longer the heroes of the pandemic in Serbia. Because the mantle of the hero, if you will, uh, has by this stage been assumed by the Serbian government and by President Vucic in particular. And now the final, you know, interesting link is that uh, this uh, very positive the PR campaign um, has not uh, um, has not stuck only to the Serbian government uh, and the Serbian population, but it has extended uh, in presenting this theme of generosity of Serbia in the region and wider. So our conclusion basically is that uh, uh, Serbia's geopolitical positioning through the vaccination campaign has really turned it from a passive to an active geopolitical actor in the region by ostensibly helping its neighbors in the second uh, in the second stage and by doing so also deflecting and obscuring insistent accusations that the pandemic had hit serbia much harder uh, than than the official figures showed and really that there were some uh, even misuses in terms of uh, uh, showing uh, what exactly had happened during the pandemic at the beginning so once again, I think that this analysis, you know, uh, should send alarm bells ringing in terms of uh, uh, the general failure of global leadership to assert, to communicate a clear message uh, to regions such as the Western Balkans, uh, because Serbia has really managed in this uh, conjuncture to set itself uh, as the regional mecenas and present the EU as uh, failing the test of the pandemic. So I think that once again, this tells us that uh, the EU and the US really need to step up their game in a region that they have uh, neglected quite a lot uh, in the last uh, in the last few years in the last decade
Thank you, Tena, and I highly recommend our audience to read uh, uh, the chapter uh, you co-authored with uh, Nikolaus Tsifakis. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask now to Richard uh, Turcheny. Uh, Richard, I know you, uh, you made a research, uh, so let's change uh, a little bit the perspective. Uh, you made a research uh, um, that investigated public opinion on, uh, on the role of China across several uh, European countries and that the results coming from Serbia were particularly interesting. Uh, could you please briefly uh, tell us what your main findings were? Yeah, thanks. And I hope, uh, I think some of these findings uh, complement well what Tana was just uh, talking about. So in September and October 2020, we did public opinion survey in 13 European countries. One of these countries was Serbia. So I will talk about Serbia only now. Um, and of course, the result might not be same in other uh, Western Balkan countries. Um, but the main finding is that Serbs see international reality very different, differently to uh, other Europeans, uh, which we serve it, with the exceptions of Russians. But uh, the 10 EU countries plus UK have very, very different uh, views on many issues. Um, some of that are um, that Serbs... Uh, China is one of the most positively viewed countries in Serbia. Um, another one would be Russia. Uh, Serbs uh, trust China and Russia. They do not trust EU and, of course, the US. Um, as perhaps the, as the only one, Chinese military is perceived as a positive force in Serbia. Um, so basically, while in the rest of the EU, the view that China is a rival is getting stronger and stronger uh, with the time going. Uh, the, the view from Serbia is really very different. Um, there are some other things. Uh, China is perceived very powerful. Uh, Serbs are the most likely to recognize China's role in their economic development. Um, and that's important, important because, so I'm not an expert in Western Balkans, so you will know better than I do, but uh, the kind of objective role of China in the Western Balkan and in Serbian development would probably be significant, significantly lower than the EU, but that's not how the, how the Serbs would, uh, would see it. Um, plus, I would argue that German economy would be much more dependent on China than the Serbian economy. But again, that's not how uh, the publics in Serbia and in Germany, for that matter, uh, would see that. Uh, so Serbs really see China as a powerful force and positive force, EU as a weak actor and um, one which they, they do not trust. Uh, Serbs prefer to align with China and Russia to the EU. Um, and these results, and that's interesting, uh, are valid across the political spectrum in Serbia. So voters of different political parties do not significantly differ, uh, differ in what I was just uh, saying. And um, to conclude, uh, in my reading, and again, from a position of someone who's not Western Balkan specialist, but just from looking at this data, uh, and also what Tena was saying just, ju just now, I think we can see an impact of the domestic propaganda by the, by the Serbian elites here, which really empowers China and make it look more positive, more powerful, um, while at the same time weakens the EU and make it look less, uh, less uh, trustful. And the reason I say it is that the, our analysis show that Serbs respond to similar incentives as other Europeans. So there is not something weird or special about how Serbs look at things. Uh, but what makes them so different is that these incentives are present in much more, much stronger way. In particular, as I said, um, China's role in economic development being one factor when they are the, mo the, the most positive, and the other one will be uh, the COVID help during uh, uh, the help during the COVID pandemic. These are the two best examples. And let me just finish up uh, what this means for the EU prospects. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine that a country like this, with this sort of views, would be an EU member. Uh, thing about the EU foreign policy standing um, and kind of divergences with uh, Hungary, maybe a bit 
other countries. I think uh, what we would get from Serbia, as this data show, would be uh, multiple times uh, of that. So this paints very um, kind of um, problematic picture about possible EU prospects of, uh, of Serbia, in my opinion. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for presenting your research. Um, I would like now to come back to the report with uh, Jovana Marovic. Uh, Jovana, in your chapter you focus on the regime change uh, uh, in Montenegro and uh, its potential influence uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on other countries in the region. So my question is, do you believe the democratization process will have a new momentum in the Balkans? I think there is a technical problem with the, the camera from... So maybe... Jovana, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know... Can you hear you? <laughs> yes, now, now we hear you. So my question was... Do you believe, uh, after the regime change in Montenegro of, uh, of last summer, do you believe uh, the democratization process uh, will have a new momentum in the Balkans? Well, I think that this was for the first time ever that I actually wrote one optimistic analysis about the democracy in the Western Balkans. So I guess there is hope for democracy in the Western Balkans. and. Uh, that this was because of the regime change in Montenegro, uh, because of uh, uh, citizens of Montenegro being able, after 30 years, to change the government and to, to vote for alternative to, to uh, corrupt politicians and to a uh, situation in, in the country which was really, really problematic. And in that sense, there are positive developments and there are some negative developments in Montenegro, but also in the Western Balkans. And there are some lessons learned from from case of Montenegro. For example, positive changes and some positive developments are that people are more and more aware about their role in democratization and they, their role in regime change. That's the first thing, which is, I think, the most important one regarding the, the change of the government and change of the ruling elite. In Montenegro. There is a recent public opinion poll, which was already mentioned by, by Tena, uh, conducted by BIPAC, uh, where uh, there is data that 80% uh, of people in Montenegro now believe that the government can be changed through elections. So this is something really important that more and more citizens are uh, aware about their role and they are more active and more ready to, to, to take collective actions and to be part of, of the of the processes and part of the changes that's the first thing the, the second thing is that it is possible to change the government and to change the, the ruling elite through a political system even though there is an even playing field it was the same situation in montenegro with unfair uh, uh, conditions for elections with the ruling party having advantage, meaning that, that they were um, they have a better coverage in state uh, sponsor media. They used uh, public resources for party purposes and for election purposes, and everything actually which is within the framework of, of uneven playing field was used by the previous. Uh, ruling party, but uh, what actually influenced such outcome, it, it was high turnout, 76%. It was great dis dissatisfaction of citizens because of the corruption, organized crime, clientelism, many, many other issues. And then uh, it was one particular reason why the change of the government was possible, and that reason was law and freedom of religion, where uh, the opposition managed to actually call citizens to vote on elections, and that's why there was a high turnout. So that's the, the second thing, that the change is possible even if there are no uh, conditions for free and fair elections. And then there are some, uh, let's say, negative trends. Uh, let's say that the change of the government and change of the ruling elite is just first 
step towards democratization, first step in building democracy, because it does not necessarily mean that the change is for better. So we are not happy how the situation is going on in Montenegro at the moment. But what is important to highlight is that the new government uh, must not repeat the mistakes of the previous government, meaning that they should um, they have to eliminate all undemocratic practices. They have to fight clientelism and nepotism, and they uh, should not use uh, public administration for their own interests. And that's something which is ongoing in Montenegro, alongside with many other issues, uh, with growing nationalism, with the depolarization and the rest. So uh, just to repeat once again, change of the government is just first step in building democracy. And I guess that the most important part is that uh, citizens uh, have to take their active role in democratization through voting uh, on elections, also through participation in decision making, because, for example, there is also data from the last year that 88 uh, percent of percent of citizens in Montenegro never actually requested the data through free requests for inf information. That's something which is really problematic in that sense. And the last point is that citizens should take collective actions and should protest and in that way challenge the, the, the governments. So yes, there is hope for democracy in uh, West, in the Western Balkans, but there are no quick solutions. All have to take their part in democratization. Thank you, Johanna, and I really hope that the citizens uh, from the Balkans will uh, uh, understand how important the democratic tools are for, for their own future. And uh, uh, Gentiola, speaking of uh, democratization, I think the European Union's uh, uh, role in the region is still uh, pivotal and that the democratization can go in hand in hand, in hand with the integration process. Uh, however, the opening of the, the negotiation chapters with Albania and North Macedonia has been delayed for years, despite this country's uh, progress. Uh, as you argue in your chapter, this is also a byproduct of the decoupling between uh, the Commission's uh, official position and the single member states uh, uh, sitting on the Council. Could you please very briefly tell us about the effects of this decoupling for the enlargement process? Uh, yeah, as we have mentioned over the, the past years, it's uh, since 2019, in the case of Kosovo, that has uh, fulfilled all the conditions and haven't seen the, the process of uh, visa liberalization because of the resistance of certain member states, or in the case of Albania and North Macedonia, since 2019. Um, and exactly the, the, the skeptical member states' tendency to use their right to vote or misuse their voting rights and vote, uh, vote veto, um, sorry, to misuse the veto power in the enlargement method sheds light, um, in, first of all, in um, about EU's internal or in-house uh, fractures and uh, unclear vision where they are heading to with regards to enlargement uh, towards the back. Uh, this behavior has made enlargement more politicized and less attractive. So uh, we have the, while the Bal Balkan enlargement is perceived as uh, premature, and we are almost aware that uh, that is true, to a certain extent, uh, it is considered also as a burden for the EU. So they are not investing as uh, they have been declaratory expressing over the years. And so the, the effects of politicization uh, have um, have brought to the to the forefront the slowing down also the council decision-making process. Uh, when the commission argues that both uh, Albania and North Macedonia have made decisive, process, uh, decisive pro progress with respect to their reform agenda, they are in uh, the commission and, and uh, its uh, representatives uh, are injecting hope for the, the starting of the um, intergovernmental, confer interga intergovernmental conferences for the two countries, creating also high expectation, especially among the, the population, because we have to consider that the, the, the percentage of people that support EU uh, accession in these countries is quite considerable. And this uh, synergy should be used uh, properly and uh, the, the expectations should be met. 
However, the, the decoupling between the Commission's official position and the, 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 the result or the outcome uh, after the member states uh, meet on the Council has led to a certain uh, binary or parallel process of the enlargement. In the case of Albania, uh, we have uh, France and the Netherlands that are not satisfied with the assessment of the Commission putting into question their, um, their measures of, of Albania's progress. And this was partially or indirectly also com uh, confirmed by uh, High Representative Borrell during uh, the um, Civilization and Association Council of last March, saying that there are some countries exactly that believe that Albania is not ready to be integrated into the EU. Although it's not just a matter of integration, but it's just opening the accession uh, talks, which will take obviously some time. On the other side, we have the, the, the case of North Macedonia, which, which is quite emblematic with Bulgaria crafting new conditions and putting accession process onto a dead end path, which compromises also the conditionality of process and also undermines the values of the EU. So to, to sum up, the, this decoupling of the behavior of, of the positioning of the Council and the Commission undermines exactly the, the EU credibility, as we have uh, of, of, of often stated. And at the same time, it also undermines the progress uh, reforms in, uh, and the related processes in the Balkans. Moreover, as a side effect, it also affects the Commission's uh, reputability and credibility and, and leads to fragmentations. The real beneficiaries of such a uh, division at the moment, uh, in my uh, point of view, are exactly the ruling elite of the uh, region. Uh, they instrumentalize the, the Commission's position at the domestic level, obviously for political purposes, arguing that in, from their side, they are okay, they are complying with all the conditionality, and uh, their progress has been positively uh, uh, assessed by a, a credible institution like the Commission. And at the same time, for what they are not performing, or at least for what they have been uh, mentioned, that they should make much more progress, they keep on blaming the behavior of certain member states, like in the case of the uh, Albanian prime minister, blaming the, uh, the elections that took place in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands last month or the next elections that are coming up next year in France. So uh, by blaming the behavior of the skeptical member states uh, for installing the enlargements, they remain, uh, let's say, indifferent to the uh, democratic reform and stagnation that is taking place in their own countries. But at the same time, they explore also the possibilities or venues for uncountable practices at the domestic level. So overall, this political spir uh, spiral that starts from the central uh, EU uh, institutional framework and, and uh, eradicates also at the, at the, the domestic level or in all, almost all the, the Western Balkan countries, brings and makes the process even more complex, paralyzes the, the um, transformation power that conditionality has been had so far, and also undermines the future European, Europe, Europeanization prospect of the Balkan, leading so up to uh, third countries, to uh, each and to the region, and to exploit the uh, vulnerabilities that these countries are facing at the domestic level for their own benefits and, and, and intentions at the same time. Thank you, thank you, Gentiona, and I believe that uh, this uh, decoupling process is uh, uh, one of the features of the so-called uh, Balkanization of, uh, of Europe, as, uh, uh, as was mentioned in the first session by Tim Juda. And uh, as we are already uh, running out of time, this will be the last question for Dimitar. And Dimitar, do you believe that, that an increase of uh, Russian and even uh, uh, Turkish influence uh, in the region can directly uh, affect the local democratic system, systems, and uh, if so, how? I don't. Um, it works the other way around. Uh, Russia and to some degree Turkey, although I think it's a different story with the Turks, are there for X number of reasons. But uh, if we talk about democracy, um, the Problems of democratic development you see in the Balkans are homegrown. So they have to do with uh, institutions, political legacies, but also personalities uh, and, and societal features uh, in the countries. Um, Russia, of course, benefits, and also Turkey in the, in, in the face of Erdogan, uh, of those deficiencies. But these are not produced by them. Um, and the same could be said about certain new member states who also take advantage. So I think these are two different, uh, different issues. 
uh, sometimes we couple them. Uh, this compromises our um, analytical rigor. Um, but having said that, going back to the issue of democratization, uh, it's a mixed bag. Of, uh, we, it's very good we brought up Montenegro because for a long time it uh, was seen as a paradigmatic example of uh, democratic blockage. But sti still we see that the transfer of power is possible. Um, Albania will be an interesting case after this prolonged socialist rule. Uh, but uh, even if Balkan democracies are resilient uh, in the sense of the minimalist definition of uh, just transfer of power, uh, those issues with the rule of law, with transparency, accountability are long lasting. So going back to your question, with or without Russia, China and Turkey, uh, they'll be there in one shape or form, unfortunately. Thank you, Dimitar, and uh, thank you to all our speakers. As I said, unfortunately, we are uh, already out of time. So I would, uh, I would like to take the time to thank each and every one of our speakers. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you all here, even if uh, in this uh, 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 virtual format. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, meet uh, all of you in person. And uh, until then, stay safe and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.